Hi, everybody. So my original talk was super long, and I was not able to upload the newest version, so we're just going to speed through some of the slides, and if you're curious, you can ask me about it later. So I'm Tessa, and today I'm going to be talking about Next Tech. And um, I'm also going to be talking a little bit about Trash Brain, which is something that I have. So what is Trash Brain? Well, uh-oh, no, nothing is working. <laughs> OK, this was a PowerPoint, but it's in Keynote. So the whole idea behind Trash Brain is basically that like, I have all of these different ideas kind of just floating around in my head, right? And they're just rattling around. And because of that, they don't really, they're not necessarily connected to like, other thoughts in my brain. They're not really like, connected to the neural network, and they're kind of shaking around. Um, and so you might get issues like, wait, I thought this was something else. Or like, I thought I knew what this was, but now I don't. Anyway, so I don't know if any of you are familiar with how ants forage for food, but basically as they're like wandering around, they leave pheromones everywhere. And so once they find food, they keep on retracing that path no matter how inefficient it is. And that's how I like to think of my trash brain thoughts because if the context is a little bit different, right, or even if it's just somebody else coming up with the same thoughts that I did, then I might not be able to recognize that pattern because that neural pathway is more static rather than dynamic. OK, so skipping ahead. Um, so here I have an example of a test I saw in our Kobe recently. And how many people think that something about this looks a little suspicious? How many people think it's not suspicious? And how many people never raise your hands for these kinds of questions? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. OK, cool. Um, OK, so skipping past that. So the idea here is that, you know, just because my brain is like full of trash doesn't mean that I can't, I lose the ability to smell trash, even if that trash is sometimes me. Anyway, so with this, uh, what I thought was a little bit suspicious was the combination of the set timeout with the next tick. And I actually asked the dev who wrote this, in review, like, hey, why, what did you do here? Um, how does the set timeout and next tick work together? Why do we have both? And I thought, you know, with my trash brain, like, wow, this is a really great learning opportunity, right? Because, like, the disadvantage of trash brain is your knowledge might not be that dynamic, and you might not be able to, like, remember everything you know in every situation. But that means that you can always be, like, surprised and ready to learn. And the dev's response was, I don't know, but if I don't use both, then it doesn't work, which, like, rage. <laughs> so um, who here has um, heard about hooks, but not these hooks? Uh, and now this is a point where I pretend to be like surprised that somebody sabotaged my PowerPoint beyond what you know I already did with my own laptop. And yes, it was me because I'm my own worst enemy. So back to the programming. This is the hook that I was actually talking about. So who knows this hook? This is like a very awkward moment for me when I was a kid, because like I, I thought hook was okay, and I thought pizza was okay, and like wanting to be a teacher when you grew up was okay. But like all of my friends were like, you have to love it. And like I didn't, so I felt very left out by their intensity, but anyway. So if you don't know, Hook is a character in J.M. Barry's plays Peter Pan, and he is terrified of crocodiles. And the reason he's terrified is because one day he was in a duel with Peter Pan, and Peter Pan cut off his right hand and fed it to the crocodile. And the crocodile developed a taste for Hook's blood, and so now he's always stalking Hook, ready to finish the job. Luckily for Hook, though, the crocodile also swallowed a clock. So whenever he's around, Hook can hear the crocodile ticking from the clock that he ate. Incidentally, crocodiles and alligators are different. And if you can't remember which one ate his hand, just think crocodile, which is a terrific joke I came up with with my trash brain when I was making this talk. So the crocodile is always coming for Hook. So theoretically, the next tick could always be the last tick for Hook. So he is terrified of next tick. And I am too, or at least I used to be. Again, skipping past that example, skipping past all of this stuff. But it's all online, so you can ask me about it later. Yep, I also went on Discord, and I was like, please, somebody help me break my app, because I can't break it myself. And this guy, Isaac, did, and it was super great. Thanks, Isaac, if you're watching. So. 
Ah. Being someone with a trash brain, I naturally grew up with trash friends. I'm just kidding, but they would always come over to my house to play, and then, you know, it would be almost time to go home, and we'd clean up, and then we would be like, hey, you know, wouldn't it be so smart if instead of putting away everything individually, we just made some kind of like pulley system with buckets and batched everything? That would be so much better, right? It's like I was born to be a developer or something. Of course, like this never actually worked out, and what would end up happening is we made a bigger mess with the cleaning machine, and then they had to go home, and I was stuck there alone with a mess. So that would be pretty upsetting. Um, so now we're going to look at a code sample that I made, and it's that same pulley system. And I have two methods here. It's not the code isn't really important. Just know that one method is a good way of adding things to the buckets, and one is bad because one is reactive and one isn't. Um, and then here, uh, Human, please look away because I put stuff on the window. Don't listen to this part. Um, so I made the pulley global so that when next tick runs in this mutated version of view that I made, which I called few because few, I managed to figure out how to hook into next tick in time for this talk. Um, I push more buckets into the pulley system so that visually they're all grouped together so you can always tell when next tick is running. And if we look at the source code a bit, we can see that Next tick takes a callback and an optional context, and then it checks if there's like a macro task thing, which is some global Boolean, and then it runs macro timer func or micro timer func, and basically all it does is it eventually runs an array of our callbacks. And if you don't understand that, that's fine. I'm running out of time, so maybe we won't talk about it later, but we'll see. Um, right. But the other thing to note here is that dollar next tick, all it does is it calls the same function, but it automatically passes in the current context as that second argument. OK, so here is the visualization I made of this, where we have the next ticks on the top, and then we have the buckets on the bottom. So you'll notice that I'm calling like the good, the good adding method, which is called rad, just normally. And then I'm calling it in a set timeout. I'm calling the bad one and another good one. But the bad one doesn't get its own bucket. It gets lumped in with the good one somehow. And then again here, I'm calling rad and bad sometimes together, sometimes separately. and. Again, something fishy is going on with the bad method, and I don't know what it is or why it's getting lumped in there. And we may never find out. <laughs> um, but if anybody has seen this talk, it's a super great talk by Jake Archibald. Please don't tell him that I love fizzy water and I don't use semicolons, but it talks about like the event loop, which is all related to this next tick stuff here. So basically, the content of the talk is like, if we think of the event loop as a body of water, and we want to pass through the water somehow, we have a few different options. So the first one is taking a boat. Only one boat can cross the water at the time. The first one is this one dude who like ferries people across on his own, and that's our task queue. The second option is a ferry. Since the ferry can fit more people, as long as you're there on time, you can get on the ferry and cross. But we also have all of these swimmers, and they're like the New Yorkers of the sea, right? So they're always ready to go whenever there's an opening. And so, so long as they have an opening, they will keep going. But if there's ever a space, then the boat is just going to rush on through. OK, so to sum up, the boat is our macro tasks, and then the ferry is something called request animation frame, and then the swimmers are micro tasks, also known as jobs in the ECMAScript standard. Um, so, okay, are the swimmers our next tick? N not quite. So, um, basically, the swimmers are kind of indirectly indicating when our macro tasks can run. And out of curiosity, I did this thing where I console logged um, in every lifecycle hook to see what was going on with next tick. And it seemed like consistently after the first next tick, which runs after the mounted hook, and I don't think you can get in between created and mounted in between there. Um, next tick seems to run the callbacks from the previous next tick right before the next next tick is called. So basically, it's just like you know roughly where all of your tasks are going. Since I'm out of time, I'm just going to rush ahead and go back to the code example that I was looking at before. Um, so what was the developer trying to do here? Well, I think probably uh, with the set timeout, he was trying to force this um, row clicked thing to wait until after some task has run. So maybe like a lifecycle hook, right? But then for some reason, he can't check the route query params um, 
until like the DOM has rendered or some other reason why he can't get that. So he's wrapping that stuff inside a next tick. Now, do I think that that's the best way to go about this? Probably not. I'm sure a lot of people can tell, tell you like a better way to test it. Like when I looked at that code, it's like, um, you know, without the docs next to me, without the code base next to me, I'm just shooting in the dark. When I asked the dev, he himself was like, I don't really know why I did it this way. So definitely if like somebody new to our app or somebody new to Vue saw this, they would probably be like, what's going on? So I think it's making too many assumptions about like some kind of shared under underlying uh, knowledge base there. Um, here are some links and resources that I thought were useful. Of course, everything is also written in the view docs. And you know, over the years, I've looked at the code, and I've looked at the docs, and looked at the code, and looked at the docs, never got it. This time, I looked at the code again. I got it, looked at the docs. And this time, when I read it, I was like, oh my god, I understand what it's saying. And it was like so frustrating that I just couldn't like get it the first time. But you know, trash brain, so yeah. So you know, probably what Hook would do in the future is, you know, when would you use next tick? You would probably use it like if you need to mutate your data, but then check if it exists on the DOM in like a test or something, because next tick allows you to get in between when your component data updates and when Vue updates um, the DOM, and then when the browser renders it. Whereas if you put everything in a set timeout or something, it would wait until after the browser render. Um, so probably none of you have ever seen any of my other talks, but keeping in keeping with the Vue uh, community's love of puns. I always try to put one in all of my talk titles. And you might be wondering where the one for this one is, Next Tick Down to Business. And with that, I'd like to close. Thank you so much for your time and patience. Have a great rest of the conference.